Good morning. Are we well? We're doing okay? All right. Most of us? Very good. It is a gift for us to be gathered in God's house this morning, to be God's people worshiping him this morning. Um, I want to take a moment to pray, uh, just trailing off of Marshall's prayer for our sermon this morning, for our time to hear from his word. I, w- I want to continue in that spirit for just a minute, if you would join me. Um, Lord, you choose to work your strength through our weaknesses. May we witness that this morning. As you take this meager offering and make it the good news of the gospel. May Christ's presence be clear to us today. May your word, Jesus Christ, be our rule. Your Holy Spirit, our teacher. And may your greater glory be our chief concern. In the name of Jesus, the Son. Amen. Friends, we are in a series that we just launched when we were at the waterfront last week on the Beatitudes, Jesus' Beatitudes that he he teaches from Matthew 5. You're welcome to find your way to Matthew 5 while uh, we get started here. Uh, We need to start in a, a really strange place, though, so I apologize. It's weird. We need to start by talking about bone music. And sorry if you're a trombone player and you're getting excited. It doesn't have to do with trombones. Maybe you are a a vinyl collector and you're getting really into, like, the resurgence of vinyl records. Um, I I enjoy, we actually have an amazing shop here in Grand Haven called Off the Record. And I love going in and talking with John about uh, what he's got in stock and um, having these ready for my turntable. So maybe some of you as well are are vinyl collectors and you want to talk music later. I love talking music. But we need to go back to the late 1940s, early 1950s. World War II is over. The Cold War is just beginning. And we go back there because the Soviet Union had created really hard lines of censorship around music. So vinyl records, concerts, etc., just really censored heavily, ruthlessly controlled by the state. Rock and roll and jazz and pop music and more, even certain types of Russian folk music, absolutely forbidden and controlled. And so if you were trying to sneak in that new Ella Fitzgerald and and Louis Armstrong record into the country, it wasn't going to happen. You're getting busted. Or like Rock Around the Clock by, uh, what is that, Bill Haley and the Comets did that first. It was impossible. Carl Perkins' Blue Sweet Suede Shoes, you could not get them in. You could not pass them around. And there was even jail time because of the censorship here. But this miraculous underground movement had started up, and it was formed around smuggling music. How would they get their contraband of music past the censors, Right? It was called bone music, lovingly. Makeshift LPs etched onto used x-rays. They would take x-rays, they would find x-rays, they would flip it over, they would create these makeshift versions of machines, of, of these lathes that could carve in grooves and put music onto one side of the x-rays. And they created this underground black market of makeshift LPs. They could, uh, they'd be crudely cut into a circle. They could be played on a turntable, and it was a really great disguise because it just looked like x-rays. They cut bootlegged records onto one side. They passed them around. I mean, look at this. Like, the, the one in the upper right kind of looks like a guy's pelvis. Isn't this weird? It looks like there's blood on the one on the bottom right. These things, there's thousands of them, and they're still popping up, and they're all over the place. Stephen Coates recently stumbled onto these. He's a musician and created a traveling exhibit about this bone music to tell the story. This is one of the things that he says. He says, they are images of pain and damage overlaid with the sounds of pleasure, Fragile photographs of the interiors of Soviet citizens inscribed with the music that they loved. Isn't that wild? 
Here's the thing, the Soviet Union was censoring the outside world to try to protect a certain reality. But bootleggers broke through with something dangerous, freedom through art. We're looking at Jesus's begin, the beginning of Jesus' ministry and one of his first teachings, but one of his biggest and most important teachings. He's just starting to preach and heal and teach, and as he begins one of his most important teachings, he breaks through an assumed reality the way that we think things work in reality with something dangerous, the kingdom of heaven And it's dangerous because God's reality does not work the way we think it works. God's reality does not look the way we think that it looks. And so we find ourselves in this series on uh, the Beatitudes, blessed are those. We contemplate Jesus' Beatitudes. We find them in Matthew's telling of the Jesus story, sort of an ancient biography of sorts, And here, as Jesus is starting his ministry, whether he means to or not, he's building a following, and there are tons of people starting to follow him. And he gives, in Matthew's account, one of his most important teachings that we know as the Sermon on the Mount. It's one of his greatest teachings for his disciples. And there's an overture, an introduction, a beginning to this Sermon on the Mount called the Beatitudes. So we find them in Matthew 5. Uh, Friends, you're invited to stand in body or in spirit for the reading of God's word. We're just going to read each week that we're in this season. We're going to read the Beatitudes together. So it's right starting at verse 1 of chapter 5, 1 through 12. I want you to hear now these words from the book that we love. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have a seat. Our focus today is in verse 3, the very first of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I think it's really important to note that Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount, one of his most important teachings, with blessing. That's big. Some of the most difficult teachings that Jesus is going to give to his disciples, some of the the hardest commands that are coming, are found in the Sermon on the Mount. But blessing comes before commanding. It's an echo of the people of God's experience from the Exodus, where Jesus, or sorry, where, where Yahweh, God the Father, rescues out of slavery The Israelite people, out of slavery in Egypt, he rescues them, and he forms them into his people. But before the Ten Commandments and the law are given to them, the rescue comes first. And when we think of the Sermon on the Mount, when we think of the Ten Commandments and the law that's given, we think of very hard teachings. We miss that it starts with grace and gifts and belonging. I think it's big that Jesus makes this his starting point. So what does it mean to be blessed? Marshall, uh, last week, um, pointed to it. He touched on it, that it's something deeper than happiness. 
a peace, a wholeness, a contentment of sorts. I've really been captivated by sort of this working definition that has come from conversations with a, a friend and a Hebrew professor um, named Travis West who teaches at Western Theological Seminary where to be blessed is to be filled up by the abundant life-giving power of God to share with the world. Uh, Travis, in thinking about the, the creation account, says it this way, in the biblical imagination, the act of blessing involves the pouring out of God's life-giving power, filling the recipient for a particular purpose. In the creation account, God blesses the fish, the animals, the birds, humans, the land, the water, and even time in blessing the Sabbath, and he infuses them with the capacity to bring forth life as an echo of the way that he has brought forth life. God's blessings are always generative. They generate life in that they participate in God's abundance. And so they expand and they grow as they are shared. To be blessed is to be filled up by the abundant life-giving power of God to share with the world. Now, the, there's a problem with blessing, though, right? Because blessing, especially if the Beatitudes are any uh, indication, looks exactly opposite of what we would expect. It doesn't fall in line the way we might expect the blessings of God to look. It's dangerous to the way that we see the world and understand how the world works. God's reality is different than what we believe reality to be. The poor in spirit are blessed. Are we willing to listen and believe? Let's work backwards with this beatitude then. All right, the kingdom of heaven. That, that sounds pretty important, right? The kingdom of heaven. That sounds like a big deal. What is it? What is the kingdom of heaven? Take 22 seconds and turn to the person next to you and tell them what you think the kingdom of, he of heaven is. Just 22, starting out. All right, you're going to have to revisit this conversation over lunch. I actually gave you 32 seconds, so it's not my fault. But, but did you notice that there wasn't like this simple, like we just turn to someone and we just say, well, this is what it is, and we're done? Did you notice the murmur? Not all of us have the same answer. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is a big deal. We know it's important. It sounds important. What is it? Let's start real quick just for clarity with what it's not. The kingdom of heaven is not the place where God's people go when they die. That's not what Jesus has in mind here. So if you said that, I'm sorry. You still get to play. You're in the game. You're with us. You don't have to leave. But that's not what's in mind here. Kingdom of heaven, the word heaven there, it's, it's plural, and it's, a gen it's not a proper noun. It's not a proper name. It's the heavens. The kingdom of the heavens is a more literal translation. It's kind of the way we would use the word skies to talk about the atmosphere or the sky above us or the air around us. And it's not a distant reality. Air is all around us, and the kingdom of the heavens is all around us in different ways. Um, Dallas Willard, I really appreciate uh, the professor and theologian, the way he defines the kingdom of heaven. He says, it's where what God wants done is done. In other words, it's the realm where God rules, where there's justice and righteousness and mercy and evil is powerless. The kingdom of heaven is beautiful, it's hopeful, it's life full, full of God's presence. Evil holds no sway, where the God of love and justice and righteousness is honored and followed, where human relationships and endeavors are good and true. It sounds amazing, right? I think so. So, promising the kingdom of the heavens to anyone is a big deal, right? The kingdom of heaven is a big deal in Matthew's gospel. It keeps coming over and over and over again. 
It's typically taught in similes because it's just so unbelievable. Similes are stories where it's, it's kind of it's like this. The kingdom of heaven is kind of like that. And we're given these little glimpses. It's like a mustard seed or a small business owner that is searching for pearls. Or it's kind of like a king who's settling his accounts or a gardener who's sowing seeds or a landowner who is hiring workers for his field, or it's like a wedding feast. Later in Matthew, after the Beatitudes, Jesus, in the middle of the scripture, or of the gospel here, actually compares it to treasure hidden in a field, and a man sells everything, everything, joyfully, so that he can purchase the field and gain the treasure. So yes, it's important. It was the most important thing, because belonging to the kingdom means belonging to God, belonging to the good and just Lord of all, being claimed and protected, being cared for, living in the center of love and justice and mercy where pain and sorrow hold no sway. Just a few moments after Jesus teaches the Beatitudes, he'll say to his disciples, seek first the kingdom of heaven and everything else you need will be given to you. And up until this point where Jesus comes on the scene, this has been a beautiful picture for God's people that they have treasured, but it was one that was to come. It's not a reality yet, but when God's Messiah would finally come, then he would set things right. Well, Jesus arrives on the scene, and he says, that time is now. And Jesus ushers in the reality of the presence of the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus, it's present Just before the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 4, we're told Jesus begins his preaching ministry and we're given one sentence. Repent, turn around, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. But in this moment, like, Jesus must have made a mistake, right? Like, let's just be honest. Like, this had to be wrong. Because Jesus, like, in this moment, He actually says out loud to people that those who are poor in spirit actually already have possession of God's kingdom. That's unbelievable. That's unfathomable. He's got got to be mixed up or something. Because we're willing to suspend our disbelief, but only so far, right? Right? I don't know if any of you have watched the like Transformer films when they've hit theaters or if you grew up playing with Transformers. I, I had Transformers as a kid, so and I loved watching the cartoon, you know. And, and 2007, the first live-action Transformers film hits the theaters, and I'm like, Megan, we're there. Listen, here we go. We didn't do midnight showing or anything like that, but we were there, and we're watching, you know, these these robots and these battles that are happening on Earth. And in one scene, one of the female protagonists starts to run away from this giant bad guy, alien robot guy that can shape shift into different forms. And she's running away and she's running away in like three inch heels. And Megan turns to me in the theater, angry, out loud, says, that would never happen. And while she's right, I responded to her, this is a film about alien shape-shifting robots destroying the earth, and that's what breaks you. (laughs) She's not wrong. She's not wrong. And uh, yeah, if you want to talk Transformers later, she's got ideas about what's wrong with the, the films for you. It sounds absurd, but Jesus is making no mistake. The kingdom of heaven truly right now belongs to those who are poor in spirit. So who in the world are these poor in spirit? Who does Jesus have in view? Who does Matthew, as he tells the Jesus story, have in view? This is the only place in the New Testament that this phrase shows up. Matthew's using an economic word And the word for poor that he uses was absolutely the strongest word available to him as he's writing his story. It means the destitute, the completely wrecked, the bankrupt, the abysmally impoverished, the abject poor in spirit. 
and using the economic words, like if we're understanding poverty just in the economic world, it's not just a lack of money. It's a lack of options. It's complete desperation and reliance on someone or something else because you are out of options. And Matthew's language admits a bankruptcy of spirit. Blessed, filled up with God's life-giving power are those who are abysmally impoverished in the depths of their spirit. Now also, Luke, in his gospel, in his ancient biography, he also has a version and a form of the Beatitudes. Matthew is writing to a different uh, in a different context and to a different audience. Luke is writing to a, a different context and audience than Matthew is. But there's a form. It's actually in uh, one of Luke's versions of Jesus' greatest teachings called the Sermon on the Plain, often. Different setting. And it, it's a different form and structure where there's blessings, at, but there's also woes. Woe to you, Jesus says. I think they both come to us as a gift from God, as Holy Scripture. They're spirit-inspired. They're complementary. They even, uh, and especially, are complementary in their differences. And you find Luke's version in Luke chapter 6. And in verse 20, it's the first beatitude again. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Is there anything missing in spirit? They had different ways they wanted to communicate this truth from Jesus to their audiences. But physically poor and spiritually poor are related to each other. Bankruptcy is related to spiritual bankruptcy. Impoverishment is related to spiritual impoverishment. If you drew the the Venn diagram based on the two different phrases, there's going to be a huge overlap in the middle. God's kingdom, though, God's kingdom is in the midst of both because when we have the scriptures given to us in this form, it can bring both layers to mind at the same time. God's kingdom is literally to be found in the midst of the poor and the poor in spirit. God cares about the bankrupt and the spiritually bankrupt. So much so that he's founded his kingdom in their midst. It's kind of like bone music where captured amidst pain and damage within the fragile lives of poor citizens, God's presence has been embedded. That's good news. It's a simple but confounding teaching from Jesus, if we're honest about it. It's reality altering, even. So I've wrestled with this simple phrase for weeks now. Way, way beyond that, but, but specifically in trying to prepare for this moment. And per- perhaps you need to wrestle too, and so I just want to share two challenges that I find from this first beatitude that we need to wrestle with as God's people. The first one is that we need to value the poor in spirit in our midst. Now, there's a question of interpretation here. The beatitudes can be interpreted, interpreted a lot of different ways, I don't see a command in here from Jesus in his language. He doesn't lay out a formula to reach a goal in the Beatitudes. Instead, what I see is a statement about what's true and about what's real. And it's easy for us to mix up prescription and description I don't think Jesus is prescribing a formula to follow. I think he is describing a surprising reality about the love of God. And that I don't necessarily know that we're aiming to be poor in spirit because of this beatitude. Humility, yes, it's all over the scriptures and we are called to it. The scriptures tell us God opposes the proud but lifts up the humble. It's all over. And the beatitude should change how we live. Sure, the layer is always present in Scripture, that it transforms us. And as guest preachers come through in this season and come and share God's word, if they point towards 
life change because of the Beatitudes, listen to them and pay attention. It's a layer that's in there. But the Beatitudes here are not a to-do list, I don't think. They are a good news list for those that are hurting. And God's saying the reality is, blessed are the poor in spirit and the poor because I'm with them. The kingdom is established in their midst. Which means, and here's the challenge, we need to actually pay attention to the poor and the poor in spirit. We need to value them because the kingdom is theirs. We are really good at hiding the poor in spirit and ignoring the poor. We're really good at it. But to be blessed is to be filled up by the abundant life-giving power of God to share with the world. The poor and the poor in spirit have something to share with us who are rich in spirit and rich in other ways because they have been completely emptied of anything other than desperation. So I ask, how are you encountering, how am I encountering, how are we encountering God because of the poor in spirit in our midst? Because they exist and they're here in this room and they're in our communities and it's really easy to walk away from them. We long for the restoration of all things. We pray for it. We pray for God's justice and restoration when no one needs to cry to, or to cry out from the spiritual poverty or the actual pottery, poverty again. And while we wait for Christ to bring that day to, to, to fruition, we join with him working towards restoration and redemption and renewal for the sake of those we'd rather pretend don't exist. And by God's grace for our own sake as well. Here's the second thing I've been wrestling with and maybe you need to wrestle with as well, the challenge. We must admit just how filled up we are by other stuff. To be blessed is to be filled up by the abundant life-giving power of God to share with the world. We have so much that already fills us. We just don't need to trust God and seek his kingdom. We're good. We've got this. We've got a pretty decent mini kingdom going on, and we're grateful for it. And I think truthfully, our collective affluence, you might feel the pinch economically or in your spirit, but our collective affluence actually makes it difficult to treasure Jesus over anything else. It's the Velcro principle. We've talked about this before in the past, right? Velcro is one of the most amazing human inventions and it needs to be celebrated more in our lives, I think. You want thing A to stick to thing B, boom, Velcro. But we're already so satisfied with our earthly mini kingdoms, so we're cool with Jesus as long as he doesn't mess anything up, and it feels like we're putting Velcro on the back of Jesus' robe, and now we can just attach him to anything else we already have going on in our lives, like he's an accessory to an outfit and not the Lord of all. I'm cool with you, Jesus. Man, all good. Just don't disrupt anything. I got a good thing going. And it's easy to turn good gifts into gods, idolizing our comfort more than Christ and valuing the good gifts more than the giver. For most of us in this room, not all of us, most of us, desperation for God as our only option, it's a nice idea, right? Nice idea, but it's not necessary. But poverty of spirit, physical or spiritual, is always urgent. We struggle to exist without Wi-Fi and warm water and Netflix. We have spare time in our calendar to gossip about our neighbor's politics, to get into social media arguments and to read up on conspiracy theories. We have savings, investment, retirement accounts. We attend more travel sports team tournaments than we do worship services. Our biggest stresses are often the ones that we make or choose for ourselves because we can't say no to a full calendar. We might have unhealthy spirits, but we are not desperate. 
And we are not out of options, so we think. And we do not feel a sense of poverty in spirit so deep that there's nothing but to cry out to God. One of our challenges in the hearing of Jesus' teaching today, <coughs> excuse me, is to admit, is to admit just how far re- removed most of us are from this reality and how desperately we're, we're working to avoid spiritual bankrupt, bankruptcy. And we're trying to avoid those who we believe are spiritually bankrupt. But Jesus, the Son of God, says, Those are the people who already have possession of the kingdom of heaven. So the challenge for me, sometimes admission, honesty about reality is our main application and admitting what's true. I got to go to Honduras to visit friends at Vida Abundante back in like 2012. And my friend Mauricio, this picture of him and his wife, Uh, He was the music director at the church down there in Tegucigalpa at the time. And I said to Mauricio one afternoon, Mauricio, I've been in your country for like three days. I've been in your home for just a few hours, and you make me feel like family. And he says, yeah, you Americans are rich in stuff. We're pretty rich in relationships. And I have to wrestle with that regularly. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs already right now is the kingdom of heaven. If we are not poor in spirit, we're invited to find the kingdom of heaven in their midst. We wrestle, but we cherish God's reality. Guys, this is such good news. This is gospel news. Marvel at this with me. Who is this Jesus? God cares so deeply about the desperate who are impoverished in spirit that he's made his home with them, establishing his kingdom in their midst. What a grace from the God of the universe. Indeed, he blesses the spiritually bankrupt for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Would you pray with me? (laughs) Merciful Lord, We confess that with us there is an abundance of sin, but in you there is the fullness of righteousness and abundance of mercy. We are scared of what it means to be spiritually poor, but you are rich and in Jesus Christ came to be merciful to the poor. May your love in us show this righteousness, abundance, and mercy. Capture our imaginations by your love. Once again, or for the first time, we are empty vessels that need to be filled. Fill us. We are weak in faith. Strengthen us. We're often cold in love. Warm us. Through your spirit at work in us, may your kindness and goodness shine through us to one another and to our neighbors to the glory of the Father. And bless especially the impoverished in our midst with your justice, peace, and mercy great shepherd from the mountainside, make haste to heal these hearts of pain until you see fit to bring the restoration of all things. Dwell among the downtrodden as you've promised. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray, amen. Friends, to respond, um, and I'm sorry I'm gonna keep you a little late. I couldn't edit some of that out like I probably should have. First, we just 